I was starting to wonder if you had lost your way. This place can be difficult to find. It's quite secluded, but I'm glad to see that my directions were adequate. Come, take a seat by the fire. It's getting dark and the nights are cold. You should try some of my mulled wine. It's been simmering for a while. I added spices and nuts and some dried fruits. It's the perfect thing to warm you up on a chilly night like this. Not long now before the frost starts to settle. Here you go. I haven't been back here in a long time, but we used to camp here often in the summers when I were little. Me, my father and my brother, when we went hunting or trapping. My father grew up not far from here, but there aren't that many people left in the area now. It brings back a lot of memories coming here. After a day of trapping, or maybe some fishing, we would have a late dinner, cooked on the warm rocks of the fire. And before going to sleep, my father would tell us stories from the lake and the woods. They were quite dark, most of them. But we still fell asleep listening to them. Would you like to hear a few? You are new to these parts, aren't you? This is a hard land to live in, and full of wild spirits. It can be difficult to survive here. It takes strength, endurance, and cunning. Many powers around us that are stronger than we are, and that have lived in these lands for longer than we have. Ancient things, born of the land itself, of earth and rock and river. Creatures we have to coexist with, and the stories my people tell are often about them, the others, our mirror image and our opposites, our helpers and enemies, the ones who wants to join us, or who wants to abduct some of us into their world, they are all of these things. You can trick them, or be tricked by them. You can treat them fairly and get rewarded, or they can kill you or take your children. You never know. We coexist somehow. We have to. In the mild summer nights of my childhood, when me and my brother lied right here, with bellies full and warm in our blankets, my father would tell us 
about his encounters with one of them, Nacken, a water spirit living in fresh water, small lakes or ponds mostly, and preferably the murkier ones where you cannot see the bottom. But sometimes he also lives in rivers or waterfalls. Like so many spirits, Nacken is a shapeshifter. He can show himself to humans in many different guises. He often takes the shape of something floating or sticking out of the water. He can make himself look like a rotten log or a tuft of grass just above the surface. Sometimes he will rise a bit higher and you can see it's not grass but a face with long hair and big eyes lurking. Sometimes he even looks like an abandoned raft or half a boat, still floating even though it should be impossible. He can also emerge out of the water in the form of a handsome young man or a beautiful white or grey horse. As a man, he often plays the fiddle just like Fossegrimen, a similar spirit that lives in waterfalls. Both can seduce you, captivate and enthrall you with their music. But Nacken in particular enjoys to capture and drown people. If you manage to strike a deal with him, he can teach you his skill, or swap your fiddle for his own, which is usually much better. If you go to him with a sacrifice, he might be willing to teach you. If that happens, you will become the best fiddler. One who can live well and even become rich from playing your own music. On some nights, you can hear Nacken cry out. It can sound like a person in distress, or like a lone bird. This is said to be an omen. It predicts that someone is going to drown or suffer some other terrible fate. Many stories tell of how Nacken captures those who drown and does not give them up. And some of them says that the drowned goes to rich green halls on the lake bed and live out their days there in Nacken's domain. I have also heard that Nacken in some places demands a yearly human sacrifice. And if none is given voluntarily, he will take someone by force. If the time is up, and the sacrifice is not made, Nacken can be heard screaming, the hour has come but the man has not. My father told me of a time when he was very young, only ten winters old. His father my grandfather had just returned from a trip. He had been trading, I think, and my grandmother commented that he seemed shaken and wondered if something had happened. 
grandfather said that on his way home he had seen a beautiful grey horse grazing by the lakeside. It had no bridle and seemed to be alone. My grandfather had a heavy backpack and thought it would be nice to ride home and maybe claim the horse as his own if no owner could be found. He approached the horse carefully, but before mounting it, he looked into its mouth and discovered that it was full of foam, like sea foam, and no teeth. And then he knew that this was no ordinary horse. He uttered its name, Nakan, and the horse According to my grandfather, immediately tumbled into the water and disappeared. The next summer, my father and two other boys from a neighboring farm played together by the lake. They were out on their own and had strayed further than usual, close to sunset, when they were about to go home, they saw a grey horse laying down in the grass. Being young and curious, the two other boys ran up to it, patted it, and climbed up on its back, which was easy since the horse was laying down. My father hesitated because he was remembering the tale his own father had told the previous year. The horse looked at him and seemed to be waiting for him to climb up. You better get off my father said to his friends, that's Nakan, he will take you into the water. At the sound of his name, the horse got quickly to its feet and ran into the lake with the boys on its back. They did not seem to be able to dismount. They tried, my father said but it was almost like they were glued to its back. They couldn't get loose. My father ran home and told what happened. It was dark by then, so there was little that could be done, but at daybreak the next day, as soon as it was light enough to see, they started searching for the boys. They searched for days, but all they could find were a few pieces of clothing. My father was never blamed in any way, but he blamed himself, I think. It weighed heavy on him for many years. He told me once, that he should have called out Nakan's name sooner, before the other boys had climbed up onto its back. I have thought about this spirit many times. All the different shapes Nakan takes is either to pass unnoticed or to lure people to touch him, it seems. It is through touch, or sometimes music, he gains power over you. If you touch him, he can take you. But when he hears his own name, he must return to his true form 
and to the water where he belongs. There is power in names. Names reveal the truth and dispels illusions. There is power in steel, too. Throwing something made of steel into the water is also said to break his power. It can be your knife, although most people would not want to lose that. It could also be something smaller, as small as a needle. Some people even say a small chant. Nick, nick, needle in water. You sink, I float. I have another story about Nakam. This also happened to my father some years later when he was a young man. He wanted to become a fiddler and play at parties and weddings. He told me later that his skills were mediocre at best and as he still worked on our family farm He had little time to practice. Years passed without much improvement to his skill. He thought of Nakan now and then. And in the end he asked my grandfather if he should seek him out. To his surprise, and mine too, when he first told me about it. Grandfather was not against it. Just be careful, he said. Go alone on a Thursday night and bring several items of steel with you, just in case. Do not promise him anything. And good luck. He has taken so many of us over the years. We might as well try to get something useful out of him. And so my father went to the lake on a Thursday night, played his fiddle, and waited. Nothing happened. Same thing a week later. He went to the lake on a Thursday night, played, and waited. Nothing. The third Thursday night, though, he met a handsome young man there, a stranger. He had long blonde hair and was dressed richly in expensive clothes. He had green eyes, my father said. They were mischievous and full of laughter. And with a smile and a smooth voice, he said, The one who got away. This, of course, confirmed to my father that this was the same Nuck who had taken his friends all those years ago. I can make you the best fiddler in the land, Nuckin said. If you promise me that when you are on your deathbed, you will come to me and I will take you, body and soul. My father refused. Your price is too steep, he said, and he turned to leave when Nuckin called after him. If you are not willing to give yourself to me, then that can't be helped. But I can still make you a decent fiddler if you sacrifice a black cat to me. Slay it here and throw it into the water. No one around here even has a black cat, my father said. 
No, I don't know if that part were true. But I do know that my father was always rather fond of cats, and probably did not want to kill one. Then Nuckin said, There is one other option. Catch a snake and rip out its tongue while it still lives. Put the tongue inside your fiddle and let the snake go. Catch a squirrel and rip out its right eye. Put the eye inside your fiddle and let the squirrel go. That will also do the trick. Then Nuckin waded back into the water and disappeared. I do not know what dark magic this was, or why Nuckin would give my father such a detailed recipe. My father told me he started chasing squirrels half-heartedly. He did not like what he had to do, especially the part about letting the hurt animals go on to live and suffer from their injuries. He could not catch a squirrel anyway, and so gave up on the whole endeavor eventually. And a good thing for me, I suppose, since he settled down to be a farmer and hunter, and eventually married, and had me and my brother. Some people, city dwellers no doubt, doesn't think Nakin is real. That people made him up to warn children away from strangers and from dangerous waters. But I know better. My father was no liar. And I myself have seen him in this very spot a few times. Actually, have you noticed a tuft of grass? right over there. It was further away before, I think, when you first sat down. It shouldn't be able to move like that. Hmm, what did I tell you? He's been listening. I wonder what he thinks of the stories we tell of him. Whatever he does with the people he takes, I think he's lonely. Anyway, we should be safe up here. And if he comes for you, you know what to do. Let me add another log to the fire, and let's get some sleep.